Okay, so welcome everyone to this uh, YouTube uh, live discussion session. We belong to the Center for Nanoscience and Engineering from IASC. I hope all of you are doing well today and all of you are curious to know and you know uh, chat with our expert here uh, about the implications of nanotechnology and uh, the, the kind of research that he does. So a bit of introduction about our expert. Uh, so his, his name is Professor Ambarish Ghosh. Ambarish Ghosh is a very well-renowned physicist. Uh, he, is, it, uh, he is a part of, uh, uh, you know, our, uh, uh, so he, he is from Center for Nanoscience and Engineering and he, he is a faculty here. He runs a research group which actually works on several aspects of physics and, you know, uh, physics, nanotechnology in physics and so on and so forth. So today he'll be talking to us uh, uh, in a in a chatting mode, essentially, we want you to participate in this discussion and chat with us uh, and understand uh, the the bigger implications of what he's going to talk about. He's going to talk about his research, which is on magnetic nanoswimmers and the bigger implications of these nanoswimmers in various aspects of uh, you know life in general. Okay, uh, so Amrish, uh, over to you. Uh, and uh, yeah, so so before I I hand over to Amrish, let me tell you that. Uh, well, if you have questions on the chat, uh, so please put them on the YouTube chat and then, you know, so I will interrupt Ambarish in between and I will start asking your questions. Okay. Uh, but please make it a lively discussion. Please uh, try to participate as much as possible and uh, keep asking your bubbling questions. Right. So I hope you're ready to uh, explore magnetic nanoswimmers with Ambarish. Ambarish, over to you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Hey, thanks a lot, uh, Pavan, uh, for the very kind introduction. Uh, so, um, you know, for this audience, uh, I just wanted to write at the onset uh, that you know that uh, we have a group web page in which a lot of details about our research, a few of our publications, patents, and the folks who actually carry out the research uh, are all available. So please do visit our group website. Uh, this is our lab logo. It stands for Quantum Fluids, Active Nano Swimmers, and 2D Metamaterials Laboratory, Quantum. That's what we say. And very recently, um, while we are located at the Center for Nanoscience and Engineering at ISC Bangalore, uh, very recently we have had a startup uh, which is doing very well. And I hope to tell you a little bit about this spin-off as well. Um, just before you know, I, I tell you uh, about scientific um, points, um, let me see if, uh, can you see my screen? Um, uh, yes, Amrish, we can, we can see your screen. And uh, yeah, go ahead. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about this uh, research program. And right at the onset, it's very important to highlight how multidisciplinary uh, our, our field to this particular problem is. So I, I really apologize if I've missed somebody here. Um, but you, you will see from the list of collaborators and the contributions from from the many students and postdocs who have worked in our group, um, that it is coming from a large variety of different disciplines. So we have collaborations with material science experts, biologists, cancer specialists, dentists, and of course, physicists, mathematicians, and even computer scientists. And especially, I would like to highlight the collaborations with our biology colleagues, uh, Dr. Deepak Saini, Ram Rebhat, and Shanmukh Srinivas, with whom we work almost on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the various students who have contributed in this research program have been listed here. And you know, uh, without this this research pro without them, this research program would not be at the state uh, that we are at right now. So briefly, the motivation about you know, nanorobots in general, and it sort of all started from this very famous lecture uh, by Richard Feynman about nanotechnology, and where he talks about plenty of room at the bottom. And what you are seeing on the screen is, um, you know, something that he mentioned in a lecture almost, uh, I don't know what, about 60 years ago, more than that. And what he talks about, um, he talks about this very interesting possibility for relatively small machines. He said that it would be extremely interesting in surgery if you could swallow a surgeon and then the surgeon goes inside the body, looks around inside the blood vessels and then finds out which valve is the faulty one 
and then takes a little knife and slices it out. So what he really talks about is this, is this really amazing vision about actually carrying out tasks inside human body by very, very small agents. Now, we probably are not talking about real doctors getting miniaturized, but can we think about little robots which effectively carry out the same tasks? So if I were to now pose the question, uh, Pavan, about you know, how these nanorobots should be, then you know, there is this beautiful movie, Fantastic Voyage. I don't know how many of you have seen this movie. It's basically about doctors getting miniaturized and actually carrying out different medical tasks. So if you were to find out, well, what should be the properties of these nanorobots so that they can actually carry out these extremely complicated tasks? And you can then try to list the many capabilities these robots should have. And that's what I've tried to list out in this slide out here. So, Ambarish, maybe I can interrupt you already. Yes, Pavan. Uh -huh. So, mm -hmm. how small do you think these doctors should be uh, to go into our body, let's say? That's a, that's, a, that's a very, very good question. And I think that depends on the application. So if you are thinking about working in an organ that's of the size of a few centimeters, then very frankly, you do not need nanobots. You can work with microbots. You can work with even 100 micron scale objects. On the other hand, if you are thinking about entering a cell and maybe causing a DNA damage right at the site of the nucleus, then we are talking about something that is less than maybe uh, 200 nanometers or so. And if you're talking about entering the nucleus, then maybe you're talking about five nanometers or less. And you know, these are very ballpark figures. But to, to answer your question, the size will depend on the application domain. Okay? I hope that answers your question, Pavan. Yes, yes. And just to give our audience a, a view of what nanometers are, I mean, our uh, a strand of hair is about 60 micrometers. That is, you know, uh, you can do the math and uh, cut it vertically into, let's say, 1,000 times or more than that, then you get sizes in the, uh, you know, in the order of nanometers. So, so yeah, so it's that small, right? So that's what you're saying. Perfect. All right, Perfect. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, and for the, that's a, that's a very good point, Pavan. And in fact, for the non-biologists in the audience, um, typical size of a nucleus can be anywhere of the size of a few microns. You know, that's basically a meter divided by a million times. Right? So back to you know, what should be the properties of these nanorobots. Well, first and foremost, you must be able to move them from a distance. And, and this is one point where I want to clarify uh, one of the misconceptions that exist in the community. So let's say you, know, you have a glass of water and you put a few magnetic nanoparticles or some small magnetic particle and you hold a magnet nearby, you'll see that these particles will sort of get dragged or get pulled by the magnet. Now, I don't call this motion with good control from a distance because you need this magnet to be very closely placed to these particles for this motion to happen. If we are talking about biomedical tasks, we are talking about having access to inside the human body at least of the order of 10 to 100 centimeters away. So you have to have action at a distance of at least about half a meter or so. Okay, So that's a very, very important attribute. And that sort of raises the question, how do you move small objects in fluids or gel-like environments with a very good control? Now, just moving them with good control is not enough. You also want to give them different types of properties. They must be able to sense diseases, diagnose diseases, at the minimum go and accumulate in the disease sites so that you can then image where the diseases are happening. So all these different functions are quite often not possible with a single swimmer. What you would like to have would be a large number of different robots working together and carrying out these different functions. Now, the possible applications, and you know, uh, I have mostly been talking about the idea of a small Voyager, you know, this uh, taking inspiration from this fantastic Voyager. Well, you are not just limited to biomedical tasks inside animals or, or, or humans. You are actually with this technology, if you can really carry out, you, you are able to carry out tasks uh, from a distance, 
you would be able to carry out functionalities in different microfluidic devices. These are extremely important for different types of diagnostic applications. You would be able to carry out tasks uh, or, or investigations that are of importance to fundamental biology investigation. So for example, right now with these nanorobots, we can go and measure different parts of the cell. And so this type of investigation can give us new knowledge. So it's also a new research tool. And then finally, you know, just being able to see how these external objects interact with living cells and tissues can quite often give rise to a new type of therapeutic modality, new type of diagnostic modality. So all of these things are highly futuristic and we are in a very amazing uh, a time right now where at least over the last 10 years or so and, and going forward, the, all these futuristic goals are actually becoming present as we speak. So it's a very interesting a time for uh, this particular field. So Ambarish, can any magnetic nanoparticle go in or you need some sort of biocompatibility? I mean, what, what type of particles can our body take in and what can it, would it reject? Because at the end of the day, you're putting in some external agents, right? That's a, that's a wonderful question. And actually, you sort of pointed out this very important uh, aspect of targeting biological applications. In a, you know, for which uh, the, the question of toxicity as well as the biodegradability quite often comes in. Indeed, that's absolutely correct. The robots that you are making should definitely be non-toxic and ideally they should also be biodegradable so that over time uh, they are removed uh, from the body and any design that you have for these nanorobots, you would like to have that. Of course, this is not a necessary condition if you're talking about non-medical applications. For microfluidics. So this is where material science comes in, right? So your Absolutely. interdisciplinary. Absolutely. So, yeah. All right. right. So you have seen in my list of collaborators in our group, with our group, we have a lot of material scientists with whom we collaborate on a, on a almost on a day-to-day -day level. So thanks for the question, Pavan. Um, so maybe for the engineers and the physics, mechanical, chemical engineers or the physicists in the audience, I want to point out a little bit about the issues with uh, moving at small scales. And uh, this is an equation, Pavan, and I, ho okay to, I hope it is okay to uh, share equations on a live YouTube event. But, so with your permission, I'm going to- If, you, if you make them fun enough, please go ahead. <laughs> so, so what happens when things get smaller? You know, one of the most important things uh, that happens as you start making, cutting things into smaller and smaller pieces is that the overall area increases while the volume remains the same, right? If you take a cube and keep on breaking into smaller and smaller pieces. So because your area increases while volume remains the same, effectively you now have more friction because friction is really proportional to the surface area a bunch of objects have. So if you have a very small object and you want to move it in a fluid or a gel, your motion is entirely dominated by friction. And that's really is what this uh, uh, formula or this, uh, this image is trying to show you. It says that if there is a small object of size A moving with a velocity V in some medium of viscosity eta and density rho, then there is something called Reynolds number, which is nothing but the ratio of the viscous to the inertial forces. Okay. So because your Reynolds number is very small, because the motion, sorry, inertial uh, 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 viscous forces, because the, your motion is dominated by viscosity, your motion is effectively like you are in a highly jelly-like environment. It's like a very dense environment. You're trying to swim in honey. If I were to shrink you down, make you the size of a bacterium, which is of the order of a micron, you would see that um, the, you know, if, even if you are in water, the world surrounding you will feel like jelly. Okay. So how do you swim in such environments? Your regular freestyles and butterflies will not work. Now, this is something, and you know, for the students out here, if you get a chance, do have a look at this paper. It's available online, Life at Low Reynolds Number. So in this paper, this Nobel Prize winning scientist Purcell uh, talks about this very interesting problem of what happens in the life of microorganisms. In the lives of microorganisms is basically swimming at low Reynolds numbers or environments where 
motion is dominated by viscosity. If you had to do a simple back and forth motion like this, you will not be able to go anywhere. And that's what Purcell says. And he actually shows it using very simple mathematical arguments, which then raises the question, well, how do you manage to move? How do organisms, microorganisms manage to move? You know, we know how E. coli swims, we know how spermatozoa swims, how do they manage to move? So I, I would strongly encourage the, the students in the audience to go and have a look at the paper, but then uh, to, to cut the discussion short and to really get to the crux of it, well, the natural swimmers over millions of years of evolution have figured out how to, how to swim in such low Reynolds number environments. So the very well known is the example of an E. coli bacterium. It has a helical tail and it rotates the helical tail. And just like the way a corkscrew enters the wine bottle, the E. coli will swim through the, uh, through the fluid. Similarly, spermatozoa, it has a long flexible filament and it has some form of a whiplash type motion. So when you will see this movie playing, you'll be able to see some form of a whip-like motion and using that, it's able to move. So if I were to make you a, a million times smaller, trust me, this is the only way you would be able to move in a fluid, in a, in a regular fluid. So our strategy of making the nanorobots is almost always or at least in most of the cases, in some form, inspired by such natural microorganisms. So very specifically, the nanorobots that I'm going to uh, tell you about today, that's essentially trying to follow the corkscrew motion. So we have a corkscrew with a magnetic moment, and then in the presence of a rotating magnetic field, the corkscrew rotates and thereby moves forward. And I, I would like the audience to uh, effectively take this as one of the key take home messages of the experimental system that we have developed in our lab. Okay. So Ambarish, if, uh, so shape is quite important is what you're saying, is it? Absolutely, absolutely. So in this particular case, the reason why when you rotate it using magnetic field, it translates is because of the helical shape. If you did not have the helical shape, they would not be able to move in a certain direction. Correct. And the direction of motion is given by the direction of rotation as well as the handedness of the helix. All right. But uh, biologically, are there no, uh, you know, organisms or anything that swims which don't have these long, you know, aspect ratio? Uh, you know, so length being much larger than the width. Do we have examples of that or everything is more or less in this longish, you know, snake-like shape? Uh, you know, if that's, a, that's a very good question. And in fact, my next slide, I'll tell you, I'll tell you sort of the, uh, the various ways in which different groups around the world are trying to make these artificial nano swimmers. And there I will point out exactly you know trying to address your question what are the other biological systems in which you will see a similar type of motion but without the this longest shape to give you a very short answer pavan if you are talking about swimming in a bulk environment far away from any surface then these are the only two ways in which natural microorganisms swim of course, there is all this Brownian motion, right? So, you know, just thermal motion will take you from point A to point B. Most of the viruses are just taken away from the fluid. You never really require uh, active swimming. But microorganisms, when they swim actively from point A to point B, if they are swimming in bulk, they are almost always doing either this corkscrew type motion or this type of a flexible motion. The situation changes when you are not close to the bulk and there you will see a wide variety of different motions, things like crawling, walking, all sorts of things come up. And I will show you some examples in just next one or two slides. Okay. So what I have in the next slide, and I think I've already told you, there are many ways in which you can induce motion, right? Uh, of course, one of them would be 
if you were to uh, uh, just use this type of biomimetic approach where you are trying to mimic the motion of an E. coli bacteria, and that's the movie that you are seeing on the screen. And here, the powering is done externally using this rotating magnetic fields. But now let's say this is not the only way. There are alternate ways in which people have used chemically powered colloids, which also behave similar to natural swimmers, but uh, there is no natural swimmer that I know that uses exactly this particular way of uh, uh, manipulation. So this is related with, uh, you might be able to see the movie, this is something that's done, pioneered by Ayushman Sen's group at Penn State, where he makes this chemically powered swimmers, which have two different types of materials. In the presence of a fuel, which is here hydrogen peroxide, a proton flux gets developed, and that causes the motion in a certain direction. And then by putting it a small magnetic element, you can actually direct their motion in any direction. So the movie that you are seeing here, I mean, if I did not tell you, this can be a movie of a bunch of bacteria swimming along. This could be the chemically powered bimetallic rods that you are seeing on the screen. And so they behave just like natural swimmers, except they are chemically powered. If, are there any natural analogs to it? Not in a microorganism level. However, there are certain enzymatic molecules which people believe also move in the same way. So every enzymatic reaction presumably will behave like a small nanomotor that you are seeing on the screen over here. And there are very interesting recent experiments that are trying to address this question. The next one, and this is very important, this is related with, uh, to, I think the 2017 Nobel Prize, the three gentlemen that you are seeing on the screen, they were uh, chemistry Nobel laureates 2016 or 17. And what they did are effectively find out, uh, uh, disc, uh, develop these molecular machines. So what they have done, they have in a way created a way of artificially actuate molecules using light, pH, temperature, so on and so forth. And based on that, they have developed these complicated molecules and they could either walk on the on a surface in a, in a way uh, that might uh, uh, remind you of motors inside cells. So they also walk similarly on, 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 on tubules inside living cells. So they really created an, a machinery of molecules that can actually do tasks down at the scale of angstroms. And again, the external control is very much at the, at the hands of the experimentalist using either light or pH or temperature. And very often these things are based on uh, uh, large complicated molecules, either DNA or oxygen, stuff like that. Um, the last one, and this is also a very, very interesting approach, is where you combine the inorganic with the organic. And this is really science fiction of you know, the, the days of those uh, cyborg robots. So very often, uh, one of the, this is just one example. What people do, people, uh, uh, scientists have managed to integrate inorganic functionalities with organic swimmers. In the movie that you are seeing there, effectively that's actually a sperm and that sperm is connected to a magnetic nanotube. By controlling the direction of the external magnetic field, you are telling which way the sperm should move. And you're not, of course, just limited with sperms. People have made this type of cyborg approaches with bacteria. Magnetotactic bacteria is a very, very interesting example where this type of biohybrid approaches have been used where the motion is coming internally from the living part, but the control is coming externally. Okay. So these are the various approaches that people have used uh, to make such artificial nano swimmers. In our group, we typically, uh, uh, we are almost entirely focused on the biomimetic approach where magnetic field is used to externally control and power this nano swimmers. Okay, so I will go a little bit on how we make our swimmers after this. So uh, this is where the material science aspect comes in. Uh, Pavan, where we use a technique called glancing angle deposition 
condition in which uh, a substrate is kept at a very extreme angle uh, with respect to some source of evaporation. And as the material melts, it goes and sticks to the substrate. And by rotating the substrate at a, at a some you know, pre-programmed way, we can make many different kinds of shapes, including the helical shape. As you pointed out, the helical shape is absolutely necessary for our application. Uh, the experiments that we carry out are not just limited to uh, such this coil that you are seeing, which is integrated with the microscope, but we now have much larger microscopes in which uh, live animals can be imaged and we are trying to now move the swimmers inside these live animals. So the movie that you are seeing on the screen right now is the motion of a single nano robot that's being imaged in a microscope where a rotating magnetic field is used to controllably move the swimmers either east-west or north-south. And all of this can be simply done by just changing the a plane of rotation and sense of rotation of the magnetic field. Um, this is all open loop control uh, for folks who are uh, uh, from the electrical background, but we can also develop a closed loop control where we tell the robots to go from a point A to point B along specific trajectories and, uh, and have some form of a feedback to control them, uh, control their paths and trajectories. And you are not just limited with one robot. That's very important. You are effectively controlling their motion with a very high degree of control, sub-micron resolution, and you should you are able to do that with not just one, but millions of them. So let me see why this movie did not play well. So let me just check. Okay, so I'm not sure why this movie it was playing a little bit ago. Okay, so you can see this movie is just playing a little slowly. So Effectively, what you are seeing there is not just one, but a swarm of swimmers going through a, some field of view. So this was a very dense suspension in which we are able to actually make a large a collection of nano swimmers move. There are, of course, a lot of practical problems. The two magnets must not come together and clump, but there are ways in which one can try to make solve these problems. And this is part of the ongoing research that we are trying in the lab. So if I were to sort of tell you the current status of the various projects that are happening in the lab, um, what we have achieved so far, and this is sort of like a, you might say, some form of a summary slide of what, what all we have achieved. One of the first demonstrations uh, was back in 2014, almost eight years ago, in which we were able to move these swimmers inside living cells, uh, inside, uh, sorry, not living cells, that will come later, inside human blood. So the movie that you are seeing here, those, those objects are actually red and white blood cells. And if you see very carefully, there is something that's moving, that's actually a non-swimmer moving through stagnant human blood. This is still an in vitro experiment. It is not inside the animal. But this was the first demonstration in which we found out the challenges that are that you need to solve to be able to move in biological medium. And what we find out is that the motion is really jammed. You're really going through a dense collection of cells. So you sort of have to come, go through the cracks and crevices in order to go from point A to point B. So while we are doing this sort of biological experiments, it's also important to realize that we also need to solve the physics problem. And the physics problem of this is really trying to solve, uh, move these objects to some form of a jammed colloidal suspension. And this sort of resulted and you know, there are associated questions of the basic physics of these active nano swimmers. How do you move through a jammed medium? How do you measure rheological properties of a surrounding medium? And how do they differ from other living systems? And there are many uh, papers in recent times uh, that sort of covers the physics of these, uh, um, you know, the, trying to address these questions. Something that's very, very important is whether you can use these swimmers for making local measurements. And one of the things that we figured out 
is just by looking at the dynamics of the swimmers, you would be able to measure the local viscosity and elasticity of the surrounding environment. The viscosity part is already well established and the elasticity part, we think we have a very nice way of making such nanoscale mobile rheometers. The question that arises is what will be uh, an application of such nanoscale mobile rheometers? One of the best examples where you need local rheological information or local mechanical information is an environment which is extremely heterogeneous. It's very complex and you want to ensure that the environment remains in that way and you are able to measure different parts of that of that uh, of that place so you know if you come to as campus hi ambarish can you hear us yes Pavan. yeah uh, so please go ahead there are a couple of questions maybe after you complete this slide i'll ask you okay okay actually this slide will take some time Pavan. so if you feel i can perhaps uh, uh, address the questions now Yeah. So uh, the one of the questions is how do we determine the number of helical turns required for a task? Aha. Uh -huh. So that's that's a that's a very interesting question, and this is related with a large number of different things that you have to think about. So, firstly, the velocity of this object is directly proportional to the geometry to the helical pitch of your helix right so the number of turns and the total length together depends on the helical pitch that in turn is going to determine the velocity now while you are doing the helix it's not just the pitch that is important but also the width of the helix the total diameter that it covers as well as the length and this in turn is a very complicated function of the geometry that you are trying to, uh, that you are trying to, uh, uh, environment that you are trying to probe. So, for example, inside living cells, we know that the filament width of our helix needs to be of the order of 200 nanometers to maybe 300 nanometers more. While in water, it doesn't matter. So, it's really very application dependent question. Uh, but in a in a in a nutshell the velocity will be directly proportional to the helical pitch and the number of turns and length in turn will govern the helical pitch. Hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Amrish. Can you hear me? I think uh, yes. Yeah, yes. we had some audio issues so far, but that was all right. Uh, the next question is, uh, you know, so you said something like uh, we have to apply. Uh, how do you I mean, so in an in, when you're doing these things in vivo, is it all right to apply magnetic field, which is sort of quite far away, you know, so, so, or are there ways of, you know, uh, applying magnetic field through some magnetic nanoparticles inside the cell or, you know, wherever you're uh, actually. Uh... Very good. Very, very good. Very good. So, yeah. So let me clarify the following. The type of actuation we are talking about it requires a homogeneous field. So the magnetic field strength is sort of constant as a function of position, but then the field direction is rotating, right? So the field direction is going in a circle. Now, this can be done using either um, some form of a Helmholtz coil configuration where you have two coils with currents uh, flowing in the loop. Alternately, you can have a large magnet that is rotating uh, at a very high speed. We don't like the magnet approach because that field falls off very quickly. So you would not get a nice rotating field when you are far away from your swimmer. So in order to do these experiments inside animals, we have constructed a large coil so that at least mouse level animals can be brought in there and any swimmer inside this mouse will see the same rotating field in a moving in a in a in a in, a, in exactly the same manner uh, rotating uh, at a certain frequency okay. perfect 
yes. you want to do this? So, I mean, when you intend to do this in vivo, in real organisms, uh, there should be a, a setup of magnetic field through these Helmholtz coils and things like that, which is, right. uh, which has a large footprint in some sense, right? So, so that's, uh, you have to right. set it up and then do it. Ah, okay. All right. So if you have to do this so in human I'm beings, doing... let's say 10 years down the line, <laughs> or well, even I'm now. Hoping before that, I, I'm, I'm hoping it is before that. So I can tell you, uh, you know, we will have, I'll tell you a little bit this application in dentistry where you know we are having coils that fit right on the tooth so there we are talking about something whose size is of the order of maybe two centimeter by two centimeter the present coil that we have in the lab which is for animals the total footprint is of the order of a meter and now if you are talking about some application let's say that's related with brain the corresponding footprint of that coil is going to be two meters by two meters. The point to note here, Pavan, is the required field is not as high as that of MRI coils. You see, it probably would not even be required. I think something of the order of anywhere between 50 Gauss to 500 Gauss is already good enough for our applications. And for that, even regular electromagnetic coils that we see in our labs are good enough. So the footprint is going to be slightly larger from maybe a meter by a meter, but not much more. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Please go ahead. Okay. So thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the uh, question, Sir Pavan. Um, related with the this question about you know you want to measure this local mechanical properties. So what will be the place where such information? Is good to know, you know, what, what will be the target environment whose information can actually lead to new knowledge or new understanding. And that turns out to be, you know, there is nothing so complex and heterogeneous as the inside of a living cell. And, and this collaborative project, we were extremely happy when, uh, you know, when uh, uh, this experiment worked out. We found out that when we incubate, when we put the swimmers in contact with the living cells overnight, the cells were spontaneously internalizing the swimmers. And then the swimmers were able to move inside these living cells. And what was really amazing was just by looking at the way they were moving, we were able to say a few things about the local environments inside living cells. So now you can imagine the type of questions that one can easily address using such magnetic nanorobots. So how does the intracellular properties change during, for example, cell division, during cell migration, as it gets older, under the action of a, some anti-cancer drug? All of these types of questions one can then uh, address by putting your probe directly inside the living cell. So this really opens up a wide variety of uh, different uh, applications uh, that was not possible before. And all of these things uh, actually worked without the cells. So you have a probe that may gives you the local measurement without stressing the cell in any major way. So this was one of the major ongoing applications uh, for the nano swimmers uh, in intracellular biophysics. Wonderful. So, Ambrish, there is a question from Dinesh. Dinesh mm -hmm. asks, uh, uh, so what is, what, what, is there a need for doing some sort of numerical simulations, especially to actuate your nanoparticles and, and uh, you know, initially in your research, do you first go numerically? And if so, what are the tools you use to actually do this numerically and then go ahead and do experiments? Or do you do experiments first and then try to, uh, you know, just, yeah, so, so, so you can, you can take the question. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's sort of uh, they go hand in hand. We have an idea, and very often we first try to do some back of the envelope brainstorming, back of the envelope calculations to see if it's feasible or not, and then we typically try it out. So you know, when we design the experiment, it's almost always backed up with some simple numbers. You know, what should be the velocity? What should be the fluid? flow that is generated, uh, what is the friction it's going to experience when we move in this environment, so on and so forth. Then we do the experiments, and as it happens in every experiment, 
we would be able to understand a few things, but then very often we don't understand many. Then comes the questions of detailed calculations. And typically, so far, the types of numerical calculations we have done are almost always based on the dynamics or the fluid flow. So we are uh, very uh, comfortable in understanding the dynamics of these objects under rotating or oscillating magnetic fields, uh, you know, how they will respond in presence of different types of media, what will be the effect of the viscosity, uh, what will be the effect of elasticity, how does the fluid flow generated by the swimmers get affected when it is close to a surface, so on and so forth. Many of these things are uh, sort of based on equations and sort of semi-analytical calculations. We have written a bunch of theoretical papers uh, where we have derived formulas for the first time and that's been used by other people for their studies. We have also done a few numerical simulations, uh, mostly in console, but not, you know, it, it does not need to be in console, uh, especially some of the fluid flow calculations. There are also semi-analytical approaches for which we have collaborated uh, with uh, uh, engineers and physicists uh, across the globe. In fact, so I hope that answers. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So if thing if standard models don't exist, you build your own models. I guess that's part of research, right? So yeah. Yeah, it sort of goes back and forth, Pavan. You know, okay. because okay. we never understand it all. And, yes, yes. Exactly. And very often, what happens when you know while we are and this happened very recently, you know, just by doing the numerical simulation, we were able to what we were trying to. Uh, explain, of course, got explained, but then the numerical simulation predicted so, something new. And now we will be designing an experiment to check that something new. So it goes back and forth, and which makes it very exciting. And you know, nobody has done this thing, so it's an open territory, and we are sort of uh, exploring them. Uh, Fantastic. Yeah. Great, great. Yeah, so, please go ahead, Abhishek. Yeah. So the, the next one, and, and this is actually related to something predominantly non-biological, and this is related with uh, predominantly uh, Shohik's work um, on trying to manipulate cargo in microfluidic devices. So very often, you, know, you have a microfluidic chamber in which there are particles, and these colloidal particles can be of the order of a few microns to maybe a few nanometers or tens of nanometers, like viruses, right? How do you manipulate them? And the standard way is to use light. Now, the problem with light is... Well, Manish, could you maybe spend a second or so saying what this microfluidic channel is? I, I yeah. will. I will. So, uh, you know, this is an ongoing area of research. It's done very uh, actively at SENSE. Uh, there are few faculty members who work on this. The main idea is to have chambers where you analyze very small amounts of fluid. So imagine that you make a fluid that is only uh, a chamber that is only 100 microns thick and where you can bring in different types of fluids, different types of uh, uh, objects come together, they can mix around and all of this goes in through some form of an analysis system. So you could imagine two different fluids comes in and maybe you can try to mix them up to make new types of particles all in such a microfluidic environment. The idea is to do it at a very small scale so that you have control over these fluids and you can analyze them down to the level of maybe few microliters or so. And this is very important in many different applications where you know you do not want to use such macro scale uh, mixing of fluids and and uh, you know you are very well limited by liquid volume or you want to find local information down to a micro scale this is very important for um, there are a large number of different startups and industries in the chemical as well as in the biological industry which make these devices a lot of mechanical engineers, uh, chemical engineers are routinely involved in this type of uh, research projects. So in this microfluidic type of problems, uh, environments, how you move small particles is very important. And very often they are done using light by using an intense laser beam 
focusing it and then by pushing the particle here and there what we did using the swimmers and i hope uh, this will be a convincing experiment uh, demonstration for you what you saw there is a swimmer coming trying to trap a particle so maybe i'll just go one step back and play this movie again so what you'll see is a swimmer and then we have given some special optical properties to the swimmer by putting some silver nanoparticles on them when you shine light this nano swimmer or this nano robot works like a little trapping agent so basically if anything is nearby it will try to pull it towards it so here's the demonstration the swimmer is swimming towards an object of interest at some point shobik turned the light on and the object got trapped it turned like a force field subsequently the swimmer was swimming from some point to another point of this microfluidic chamber at this point we will reduce the light and then turn the light off and as a result that small particle simply got from one end of the particle uh, one end of the environment to other end now this is extremely important because now you are able to manipulate cargo at orders of magnitude lower laser intensities than what was possible before so such level of nanoscale cargo trapping transporting and releasing uh, was not possible um, in in any other existing technologies back to a biological application and this is a extremely interesting work in a collaboration uh, that deban and dharma did and this is very very related to the final biomedical applications of the nano swimmers and this was a really amazing uh, observation pavan what deban did in this experiment he took a culture he took an environment in which both cancer as well as normal cells were present and then he just randomly moved the nano robots back and forth just as if he's going and sampling the environment and it turned out that after maybe about 20 minutes of this back and forth motion all the swimmers were sort of stuck near the cancer cells the ones near the normal cells were still moving but if by chance it came near a cancer cell it could not move anymore as if the cancer cells had some type of a force field that attracts the swimmers we really went into the biochemical reasoning of this and it turns out that cancer cells have some acid called sialic acid secreted which modifies the local environment and the nano robots because of their charges were basically getting stuck near the cancer cells now the implication of this work is is really far it's it's quite uh, um it goes goes quite far because now you can use this technique to image cancer cells so any cancer cell where there is this type of sialic acid secretion can thereby be imaged to this type of external agents and while this experiment was done in an in vitro outside the body setting very soon we will hopefully be able to try this in live animals and see if the swimmers preferentially all go and accumulate near cancer cells so this will That's be a way of diagnosing cancer i i guess i uh, we take a pause there and really appreciate <laughs> that part of what just ambrish had said uh, right so so you're able to localize these things i mean using physics and you know electrostatics and everything uh, you know so these swimmers are actually going aggregating at the cancer cells and you know so so you can actually image them otherwise it's quite difficult to image them right ambrish absolutely you see They, just sir inside the body there are no easy way of imaging them from a distance right But now imagine these swimmers they already have some magnetic properties you can give them further properties so that they can be seen from outside and now with time if they go and accumulate near the cancer cells over a long time then you would be able to say that okay there must be something fishy going on in this part of the organ why are the swimmers all accumulated there That, wonderful so do you have any uh, idea of how selective this is is it that only cancer cells release this acid and get charged in a way that you have described or 
uh, you know, can this happen? What are the false positives rather? Oh, so we absolutely. So, so very good question. Actually, these are exactly the types of question one should be. Uh, we we did ask during the course of the research. We tried this with four different types of cancer cells and normal cells, and in none of the normal cells we could see any sticking of this sort. But all the cancer cells showed this sticking behavior. What is more interesting, and and this I st nobody knows why. The more aggressive cancer cells had a higher force field. They basically applied a larger sticking force to the swimmers. So it seems that the more aggressive cancer cells have a greater remodeling of the environment around it, which makes it extremely sticky. And that's basically, uh, there must be a very deep biological reason that at least we have not figured out yet. That's, that's great. Wonderful. So uh, can you selectively maybe kill them? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. So that really is the whole no, I see. Right. So if you can image them, then one of the things could be is if the swimmers are also carrying some drugs, once you localize them, we should be able to then release the drug locally so that the drug preferentially goes to the cancer cell. And such selectivity is extremely important because, you know, normal, at least in cancer, normal cancer therapy, you know, the, the side effects uh, that come in is because of the lack of selectivity, right, of the chemotherapeutic drug going only to the cancer cells. We don't have that. That's the main, a huge problem that uh, uh, we need to solve. So I guess, uh, let me ask you, so uh, in let's say 2000s when i was when nanotechnology was fresh and a buzzing uh, magnetic hyperthermia hy hypothermia or hyperthermia was pitted as one of the big things that you know nanotechnology can achieve and are we close to that you think or uh, or are there other ways of doing this your comments on that yeah please go ahead so magnetic hypothermia is very much a valid method to increase the local heat and to kill cancer cells. And in fact, we have even used our nano swimmers to take them close to a cancer cell and then preferentially kill just those cancer cells. Wow. So that also works in a, so that's perfectly reasonable. And, but you are not just limited to magnetic hypothermia. You see the robot design, and this is where the material science and the nano engineering comes in. You can, have different functionalities integrated onto your nano robots so that you can uh, have different therapeutic modalities integrated in one swimmer. Hmm. Oh, so right. that's that's highly possible. Yeah. Great. So there are some questions about will you offer internships, but maybe we can take them later uh, yes. towards the end. Uh, the other question is, uh, can you make these helical nanobots as sensors for detecting biomedical applications? I don't know what detecting, but yeah, so you can interpret that question and answer, uh, Abrish. Indeed, indeed. So in a way, the thing that we just discussed is basically a sensor of a cancer cell, uh, right? That's, and it's happening within the, in a 3D microenvironment, which closely mimics a tissue. If you're talking about biosensing applications uh, in a complex and heterogeneous environment, these swimmers are ideally suited for them because we would be able to move them around and actively hunt for specific biomolecules. And there has been work from many different groups in using such nano swimmers for biosensing type applications. Okay, so that's uh, absolutely a valid question. I see. And also Shivani has taken more interest and has read your papers. And she says, uh, can we sense the pH of sialic acid using this helical uh, nanobot? So essentially pH sensor. Yes. So that's a very, very uh, interesting idea, Shivani. Uh, I think, you know, right now, one of the things we are doing, we are trying to integrate a new platform on these swimmers uh, based on dendrimers. And it is very easy to actually make this dendrimers pH sensitive. So what you are saying is perfectly valid. 
we would be able to, we should be able to uh, actually integrate the pH sensing with the uh, nano swimmers and thereby measure the pH of sialic acid in cancerous environments. That's a very good question and uh, perfectly and a very good idea. Very nice. There is another person who just says hi. So hi to you too, I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Please. Uh, I will try to maybe not take too much longer, Pavan, because we are at 6.50 already. Just very briefly, um, there is a recent spin-off from the group, um, with uh, which is on dentistry. And But before, rather than before telling you what that is about, let me tell you a little bit about where we are. And this is very important. If you go to this great goal, this futuristic goal about driving swimmers, doing this fantastic voyage in, in human beings, few has few uh, tasks have already been achieved. So I already told you about blood. It can be thought of as a dense colloidal suspension in which we were able to move things. The ETH group were able to move the swimmers in the peritoneal cavity, something in the gut. And this is, again, a very interesting uh, demonstration because the peritoneal cavity is related with many cancers, uh, uh, the cervical cancer, ovarian cancer. And they were able to show how the swimmers were moved inside the peritoneal cavity of the mouse. And uh, even we have done some work on along this direction. Special group. Um, I guess Stuttgart and Heidelberg now is were able to show that you are able to move the swimmers in vitreous humor, and this is again a very far, uh, a very nice application related with drug delivery in the retina, which is a huge problem for uh, uh, for people with retinal diseases, and they were able to move the swimmers uh, in this type of an environment. What I told you about a spin-off from our group, we managed to move the swimmers inside the dentinal tubules, which is inside the teeth. And I would recommend others to read a little bit more about us uh, by going to theranautilus.com, where a few more details about this technology is given. Now, what I want to point out is that if you want to create a platform that sort of solves, that moves in any environment, that's an extremely difficult problem. If you think about hard tissues, if you want to go from a mouse into a human being and think about any organ of a human being, you have to think about the general structure of the hard organs that we have. And this is typically made with collagen type. Collagen is the major component. And it's an extremely charged, sticky, porous environment. It's moving in there is anything but trivial. And it's also extremely heterogeneous. So how we will be able to move them using nanotechnology is something, is a problem uh, that I'm sure is going to keep us busy for some time. As of now, uh, we are going to be in mouse level already in the regulatory level, hopefully by next year. And then, you know, once the regulatory levels, at least for some of these lower hanging fruits are done, hopefully in parallel, we can also go into uh, some of these more difficult problems. So we are in a phase of this field where it's sort of going, there are lots of interesting science, deep science problems to be solved. But in parallel, we also have a very nice technological demonstrations, which are now getting productized. So it's one of the most exciting times to be in this field, in my opinion. Okay. Um, That's wonderful. Yeah. Please go ahead, uh, Ambrish. Uh, yes. So, Pavan, uh, in the interest of time, I, I will not, um, maybe, I'll just take two slides and tell you about some of the advantages of the techniques that we have. And this is where the material aspect comes in. So I have not told you these details, but there are many different ways in which you can have this multiple different configurations of magnetic materials, helical shape, so on and so forth. 
one of the things that we are doing, and I think this has to be part of a completely different um, YouTube session, is that we are now able to integrate nano diamonds, which for people who do not know, are little quantum sensors. And we can integrate them on these helical swimmers. And using that, we can actually sense chemical species. So the question that came sometime back with the biomolecule sensing, hopefully we will be in a place in a year or so where we would be able to take the swimmers in different complex environments and be able to tell you the presence of certain types of chemicals. And very frankly, from the perspective of sensing, there is nothing as good as NMR. Of course, this is not an easy problem. This is really at the limit of quantum sensing and technology, uh, you know, the one of the most difficult quantum sensing applications that we have taken up. But I think we should be able to uh, make an impact there soon. In general, we believe that with our swimmers, we should be able to deliver drugs, measure things in various sub-micron spaces that are typically not uh, open uh, uh, or possible with traditional techniques. So there are many different functions, many low-hanging fruits that we can uh, that we can attempt. A very important physics question that I have not really addressed here is actually probably not correct to say it's a physics question. It's it's a robotics question really. So it can be for anybody, physicists, engineers, biologists. So far, I have only told you about how we move them in a controllable manner. But if you want to make things intelligent, you want to have a little bit of randomness. So right now, you see, we have these things. They're all going in parallel in a certain direction. The fuel is given by magnetic field. Is it possible to imagine a system where you do not specify which direction they will go, but rather they will interact with each other and the surrounding and figure out the best task ahead. So in some sense, just by giving them fuel by magnetic fields, but let the environment and the design allow them to show some form of a collective intelligence and allow them to make decisions. And that is an ongoing effort in our group to make some form of an all magnetic active matter. And just looking at these amps and seeing how they're doing this is, is you know, can we also think about something along these lines? Uh, so that's the last thing that I wanted to mention. Uh, I must um, tell you these are great opportunities, at least this particular aspect, uh, great opportunities in physics and robotics. Um, I want to conclude the things that I wanted to say. So, you know, we have so many different functionalities. So, you know, you can really imagine, you can think of an application and we probably will be able to come up with a solution. Uh, we have really established that these things are non-toxic and, and that's very, very encouraging. And so, which is why we are now thinking about going into human trials uh, sometime end of next year by 2023. And hopefully we will be able to go to human trials. Uh, this is also a great system to study the physics of active matter or to understand important questions in, in robotics. Uh, I would like to thank everybody uh, for their for their interests. You know, there are great medical applications that of, of course we are trying, but all of this would not be possible without this uh, uh, very, very uh, versatile, diverse group of very hardworking scientists. Uh, who work hard and also, of course, have a lot of fun with fluids. Uh, these are all the slides that I wanted to show, uh, Pavan. Thank you all. Uh, Wonderful. So they're having fun with the more larger scale fluids, but also probably even more micro scale fluids, right? So uh, wonderful. So uh, maybe I'll, uh, there are a couple more questions. Uh, you can take them. Uh, uh, there are many. Uh, so this is also my question, actually. So why is there a partiality towards magnetic fields? Why don't you actuate it to some other way? Uh, do people do that? Uh, is it your preference or? Yeah. So, so that's the question. Uh, and then he's saying, is it cost? Yeah. So I, I guess this is, again, the question from Dinesh himself. He says, is it more cost effective compared to other actuations? So yeah, go ahead. 
So we like magnetic field because it's very benign. See, the sort of fields we wish to use anywhere between maybe 100 Gauss to 1000 Gauss. There are known studies that says this is absolutely safe for human body. If you think about any other structure, you know, be any other form of actuation, let's say chemical, you would have to, you are limited with only certain types of environments, right? So for example, there are interesting studies where people use the acid in the stomach, fuel, that is a chemical fuel approach, but there you are really limited to some. On the other hand, the magnetic field is perfectly benign, so it will work in pretty much any situation. With respect to cost effectiveness, I don't think so, because you know at the end, we are talking about coils and power supplies and all of that, and they are nowhere close to even an MRI machine, so much, much less than that. So I think even economically, this will make perfect sense. So Dinesh, it may be useful, so because he is asking for more details on other forms of actuation, and we are almost at the end of time. So maybe we can, uh, you can write to Ambrish and he can share you some papers and you can start discussing. Okay, so this is actually the uh, the purpose of such meet, such uh, you know YouTube sessions is for to uh, for us to instill some interest in you and you know you can start the discussions uh, from here on because it's going to be a long discussion I'm sure, right? Uh, then I think I'll take the question on internships. We have an internship program. Since internship program, please go to our website and look at it. There are certain specific times when you can apply for it. And you can definitely come and uh, work with Ambrish if you get through this program, right? Uh, yeah. So with that, uh, maybe I will also, uh, if there are any more questions, one or two brief questions, please feel free to place them on the chat. while. You know, so I am really impressed with the kind of work that Ambrish is doing. Uh, uh, so this is, uh, you know, uh, so it's a combination. The, the, the thing that I want, you know, our audience here to appreciate is uh, at some point, this is a combination of material science through which he makes these nano helices. Uh, you know, that there is, a, there is optics, for example, where he uses the silver nanoparticles and puts light and then he has to study, you know, how light interacts with the matter and uh, you know, so so there is a lot of interest for people who are doing optics. Uh, there is a lot of interest for people who are actually, you know, so when I was studying nanotechnology, you know, it's all solids for me. So you make solids small, you make solids small, and you change the properties of solids because I was trained as a material scientist. But now Ambarish tells us that you have this field of microfluidics where you are actually controlling the flow of liquids, uh, right, by making them as small as possible. And that is, you know, all your biological system. So you have to actually know microfluidics and it comes in the realm of mechanical engineering, robotics, uh, yeah, you know, so and all these things. So, so you can see how interdisciplinary is this one problem or one statement that he started with or the group started with. And then they are now branching out into so many uh, different areas. Right. Uh, so so all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, that's that's the beauty about nanotechnology. It tries to integrate. There is there is no real boundary between this discipline and that discipline. It tries to integrate over uh, all the disciplines, right? Uh, now, Dinesh, uh, maybe last question: Any effect of magnetic field on human body while actuating? That's uh, maybe we can end with that question. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So at least with the types of fields we are talking about, uh, uh, Dinesh, there should not be any, unless of course there are implants, and that's a separate problem altogether. But 1,000 Gauss is quite safe, and that's really where we think we would be able to move our swimmers easily. Um, thank you, Pavan, for a, for a very uh, interesting summary. And again, I, I agree. This, is, this really all started from one question. And we are still just trying to address various questions uh, you know, that sort of emerged from this one goal of Fantastic Voyager. And it is a very multidisciplinary effort. And both the group and the collaborations are all very, very multidisciplinary. Wonderful. All come from Wonderful. different disciplines, which so, makes it very fun. Great, great. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ambrish. Uh, this was very, uh, very nice and very, I mean, I, I learned a lot for sure, and I'm sure our audience did appreciate it. Uh, now, if uh, please do subscribe to this channel, and, uh, you know, so you may also want to spread this because we'll be having such sessions from other people working in sense which will be you know as interdisciplinary as you have seen today and as interesting as uh, the talks the talk that you have seen today uh, not the talk i should not call this the talk talk is a boring word so this is uh, you know so uh, discussion rather right 
Uh, so, so let's uh, conclude for today. But uh, please uh, subscribe to the, our channel and also please try to spread this word among your friends and you know uh, who are interested in uh, you know exploring more about research and who are interested in what happens in research in India for sure, right? So, so in in places like ours, which are this interdisciplinary and you affect all aspects of human life in some sense. Okay. Uh, all right. So with that, shall we uh, conclude, Ambrish? Is that all right? Absolutely. Thank you so okay. much, Bob. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. So maybe if you have more questions, you can feel free to email Ambrish. Yeah.